Sometimes the very best way to solve a problem is to beam bioweapons directly onto the bridge here at Future Please, a heinous trip at Warp 5. My name is Joseph. And I just can't seem to get away from the augments this week, man. <laughs> Got Wrath of Khan. We're back with this. I'm your co-host, Peter. Peter, we've talked a lot this past week, so... Well, there's something I wanted to bring up last episode, and, and I want to bring it up here. It's a name we haven't talked about in a long time. Uh, Kenneth Biller, Kenneth Bewilder. Just kind of that little... is a name that we have not talked about in some time. Yes, what's brought Kenneth Bewilder to 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 mind? I don't here? know. I was driving, and his name popped into my mind. I was listening to one of our back episodes, and it was you know an Enterprise back episode. But just what a what a very different product Enterprise is from Voyager. Uh, Biller brought us some of the best Voyager episodes and some of the worst, and just that wild variation. <clears throat> Compared to where we're at in Enterprise right now, I don't know, man. I, I would have liked. I'm curious whatever happened to the guy. He was so big on Voyager. I wonder if he left Star Trek, if if Berman and Braga left him behind, what kind of impact he might have been able to have on Enterprise and what he at his peak and Manny Cotto working together could have done. That's an interesting thought. I'm going to take a look quick here. So, Biller. Let's, put in. Let's take a look at uh, kind of where his... Yeah, I mean, he just was Voyager, as you've noted. Um, after Voyager came co-producer, writer, and director on Dark Angel, Smallville, and North Shore. So there's your answer, Peter. He went and decided, I'm going to do young adult stuff on the CW. That's where he left. CW is what UPN turned into. Correct. So it started as a WB. Like Smallville was on both channels. You know, it it made the the conversion. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dark Angel, I guess, was Fox. But it kind of felt like it was a show that should have been on the WB for a lot of reasons. Had that sort of young adult feel to it. Uh, He's also, he did an NBC show. He did E-Ring, which was much later. But yeah, that's, that appears to be the uh, answer to your question is he's just like, uh, I'm moving up in the world in terms of TV production. I'm done writing schlocky sci-fi. I'm going to start writing schlocky young adult action. (laughs) (laughs) Moving up. We're moving, moving up. up too. We're moving into season four, episode sixteen, Divergence. This guy was uh, first aired February twenty fifth, two thousand five. Judith and Garfield Reed's Stevens. Good to see uh, them are the again. writers. Yep, and then David Bartit. And this is his first episode. It's David uh, Barrett, but yes, this is his very first Star Trek episode. Yeah. Part three of the Klingon. Oh, no, sorry. This is part two of the Klingon uh, augment virus. Again, these arcs. What a what a good way to tell a Star Trek story. To be able to not have to rush through these plots. Uh, And again, they're getting extra mileage in all of these episodes because these the arc overlaps that we're getting out of the season four, them going back and tapping into uh, plot points that they've really fleshed out in previous arcs just adds so much more uh, texture to the stories that they're telling and to great results, I think. And also to bring back around again, something we've mentioned before, but in these moments is worth revisiting is one of your primary complaints about Voyager that he's never spent the time living in their good moments and instead seem to run away from them as fast as possible. And these arcs are essentially giving you that extra content that you were craving. Like, why isn't this a two-parter? Why, you know, like, why didn't we focus more on this? Why didn't we just extend out this good story and give this more luscious detail rather than running to the next stupid idea you have to make a, a C minus episode? And that's what this is. That's what these arcs are allowing you to and do. It's a, it's a two prong argument at that point. 
why are we not spending more time in the good moments while we're telling that story? And again, the other sin of Voyager is that you would tell a great story and then never speak of it again, even yeah. if the events of that episode are of uh, complete relevance to whatever the dilemma of the week is in this episode. And again, here we've got uh, Enterprise using its own continuity to 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 great heights of uh you know fun sci-fi stuff going on manny coda calls this one his favorite episode of the season i think that i would not agree i know exactly what my favorite episode of the season is and is to come uh but it's it's another solid entry into the season four canon and boy do we start in a cool spot so we we last we left our heroes they had a ticking time bomb of this speed plot that had suddenly broken out on Enterprise that they can't Ooh. slow the ship down otherwise they explode and they need to do some fancy engineering to be able to solve this problem now fortunately for them fancy engineering what <laughs> they they're going to troubleshoot this thing uh, with the same playbook as the guy at the internet company when your shit goes down. All right. Turn it off and turn it back on again. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it's this is a complex machine to turn off and turn off on again. So, you know, and they show that complexity enough mm-hmm. that I buy. Like, this was something that you need really expert hands to handle. But uh, Columbia, being out there now, can come and help. Because the idea here is only trip knows how to do this as the only real person who's ever worked on these engines extensively in operation in space. So we need trip on the enterprise to be able to pull this caper off. However, we can't slow down and we can't beam and uh, him uh, to each uh, ship at warp. So we're going to have to transport him using a cable connected to the two ships that have to be 50 meters apart, sharing the same warp field while traveling at warp 5.2. This is the caper we're going to start our fucking episode on. And Archer's going to go down to the brig, explain all of this to Reed, and Reed is going to be allowed out of jail because Reed's the only one who's ever actually done this, albeit only at warp one and after like practicing it for three weeks. It's a hell of a way to start the episode. (laughs) The stakes are high. I don't like the cinematography through this. I think it came off as cheesy and shitty, like uh, the shot of like Enterprise flying and then the camera goes over it and then it hits Columbia and it zooms through Columbia's hull and ends up on Hernandez's. Oh, yeah, that's like might be the strangest camera. That is the weirdest shot I think I've ever seen on Star Trek, period. Just it was very awkward. It was a very awkward, f- close zoom. Conceptually, on paper, I bet it sounds good, uh, but it is not a Star Trek thing, and they did not have the special effects budget to make it look good. Um, the conversations between Archer and Reed, where he goes in and he's just like, you know, because the last time they talked, it was very, uh, you're my prisoner, and I'm your boss, and I'm angry. He goes in there straight business, like, uh, like he's in his bedroom, like, hey, buddy, wake up. Um, Here's the situation and blah, blah, blah. And the, the, the camera's like zooming in close for like Reed's reaction and like punctuating the soundtrack and like the action, like the um the emphasis on the dialogue. Like, oh, we're, you know, that's impossible. Has anybody ever tried it? It felt very 24 in a bad way, right? Yeah, it was definitely trying to be 24 slash born yes, identity or something. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It, uh, An unnatural fit for sure. It was the wrong cinematography of this. The whole thing, cool. And I didn't want it to be cool. Like, okay, they shoot a cable between it and then you really understand, all right, he's about to go in a space suit and, and zip line between the two of these like, I wanted to roll my eyes and be like, this is fucking dumb. A trip hanging between the two ships, moving at warp five and just looking at the stars in a spacesuit. I, I, I wanted to 
to say it was dumb. And it was just fucking cool, man. It was. It was they, some it was some real Star Trek, you know, problem solving on your feet. You know, like this is where this shit comes from. I don't know why I'm sitting there trying to punch holes in the scene, but it's like, I mean, if they extended the warp field, like, sure, he's caught in. Like, As far as I can tell, the space math all checks out. They crossed their T's. They dotted their eyes. They put enough techno babble in there that they could just do some s- sweet cliffhanger shit I, I agree that they ultimately do explain the techno babble enough that you kind of buy what's t- happening even though it's very weird it's a shame they did not take some of that energy and save it for the end when there's a couple real critical things that just kind of go on un- unexplained <laughs> that happen uh, like, how exactly did you beam this bioweapon onto the bridge of this Klingon ship with its shields up <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of winter, but you know, I, I've got a I've got a head cannon idea for that we can discuss later. But um, we'll get to that. My favorite part about all of this is that it's just the intro. Yeah, a ship that cannot break off of maximum warp, requiring this level of heroism and uh, and and action. Uh, would have been a season one or season two or Voyager, like an entire episode dedicated to just this. So for however hokey it could have been or eye rolly or whatever, um, I thought the action sequences overall fit into a nice story. And the whole thing was done in like 10 minutes, right? Yeah. And it was a real clean way to get Trip back on the bridge of or uh, back onto the Enterprise. Uh, I thought him running around in engineering was probably the best use I've seen out of a Star Trek set. Like they played with every inch of that room to a degree that you don't ever really see Star Trek like actors hands on on set pieces. Yeah, they, 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 I don't know if that was a direction thing or if it was an actor thing, but. You're absolutely right. He's climbing up on stuff. He's purposely moving from place to place, pulling, you know, he's out shouting orders like he means it. Like, this is all Fugazi, right? Like, this is all made up. And there's no rhyme or reason to what he is doing. But he makes you believe that he is doing complicated space engineering on this complicated engineering thing through his actions and how he's very much meaning what he's saying. It reminds me of when we were watching event horizon and you have all of the crew of the Lewis and Clark who are doing their things at their stations. And it's like, they they make you believe they're doing the things that the plot is saying that they're doing, even though it's just, they, they have to come up with a pattern of like, okay, I'm doing this. What does that look like? Right? So kind of trainers up here. It's like, I got to cold restart this engine on the fly, reboot it in what should take hours and minutes. What is that going to mean? I got to climb up here. I'm going to pull this shit out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump down. I'm going to tell you to do that. I'm going to tell you to do that. And I got to fucking mean every goddamn word. And I have to make sure that every second counts because this is supposed to be under the gun. Right. I mean, it it's not just uh, Colin Trenier though. Like everybody is interacting with the set. And it, yeah. A lot of times in Star Trek, it feels like, the actors, they might as well just be on a, a green screen and not see the actual set that they're on because there's no physical interactions. This thing, it felt like, I don't know what David Barrett's history is. I don't know if he was watching the show. I don't know if he's a nerd. I don't know if this guy showed up to record and was going over this stuff. And some nerd that works on crew was like, hey, man, you know, this is a really cool set. Did you know that? Let me, let me show you. Did you know that this wall panel goes down and we've got a hydraulic lift that brings up like the the plasma injectors? Did you know that there's shit on the top there that opened like we've built this really cool set? These these switches, they click, bro. We're getting canceled. Let's use it. <laughs> you know, like, right. let's get this shit on screen while we still can. Uh, like someone who who was somehow involved in building the set or had just some level like nerdiness like yeah we this this thing does cool stuff like have them touch this shit show these corners uh it, it's the first time i've seen this set specific it's real easy for us to hook up pyrotechnics you have stuff exploding in flames uh the most kinetic shot i've seen in an engineering 
without combat being involved. And even when there's combat involved, they're still not interacting to the degree with the, the surroundings that they are. So that really stood out as fucking cool to me. They solved the problem. And, um, Columbia actually envelops Enterprise in its own warp field to keep them going fast, to, fast while they're restarting their engines. But it works. All is well. Um, I also like real quick reads like, has anyone ever tried this before? Like, dude, we're in the only warp. Has anybody ever tried to zip line a guy at warp five? Well, we're in the only we're, we're in one of two warp five. <laughs> oh, did of- you do it? <laughs> I guess otherwise it wasn't done. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you do kind of blur some like how convenient that hot rotted up enterprise running at its peak after all the technology it's acquired through you know andorians whatever this and that like columbia on its maiden voyage is able to hit what enterprise has had to work up to and you could say all right well maybe trip had the influence to be able to it yeah uplift it but trip showed up there and like the wheels weren't even on the fucking thing yet so good on that columbia crew for really being able to pull it together It's it's ensign rivers man yeah. It's Seth MacFarlane. He's Seth learned McFarlane. on the job. At any uh, point in the last couple seasons, or I'm sorry, the last couple episodes, do we get uh, a situation where Trip gets to be in the room with a uh, with someone from the Warp 5 team that was like theoretical and like give me the scene where he argues and tells them like how it really is in reality? No, I don't think so. I don't think ever went there. Because we got that a little bit with like the transporter episode, but on my list of things, I, you know what? Hey, um, put it on the Manny Cotto Ouija board. Was, yeah, the, was the there theoretical a, season five Ouija board? Yes. W- was there a, a, the scene where Trip gets to argue with the guy? What have you done with his Leah Browns? What have you done to my engines? <laughs> I made them better. You yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, Trip is back on Enterprise, as he said. He's going to help get their their house back in order. Uh, but specifically, uh, Archer gives Hernandez a call and be like, hey, you doing anything? You you want to you want to do some cool shit? You want to you want to you want to do space Archer style? You want to go into Klingon space with me on your first mission? Think about that. Yeah, you are <laughs> given command of the 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 NX02. Right. Right. This is a big fucking deal. It's you got a black eye because you haven't been able to get this goddamn thing out of into space yet. You got a rookie crew of limp wristed sissies. As we saw when Trip went over there and started trying to run that ship, you've got people trying to transfer out of the department and get away from like the Starfleet that this organization will have to become. And you're probably thinking you're going to do a couple milk runs. Hey, we're going to go out and fly around Venus and come back. No, you're going out to wherever the fuck Enterprise was pushing these engines to the limits. And now uh, whatever your plans you thought they were going to be. Hey. We might be going into a war with the Klingons or who the fuck knows all that shit we talked about on that hike where I said, hey, you better have Makos. (laughs) I'll. You need Mako. Sometimes you got to find out why I was telling you the truth. (laughs) Sometimes you got to have those Makos to take your own security chief to the fucking brig. I'm trying to do a mission. Half my bridge crew is either off the ship or in the fucking brig. (laughs) Come on. We're going to have a drunk uncle adventure. (laughs) You want to go cause a diplomatic incident? (laughs) We're in Starfleet. We got to set an example for everyone to come after us. So let's go to Klingon space and start shooting at them and hope that there's no consequences. By the way, when I was lecturing you uh, when I was uh, suicidal uh, about how I had the audacity to go out into space without even having my phasers hooked up, you took that to heart, right? Because we're going into Klingon territory hot. (laughs) When I start shooting people... (laughs) You got my back, right? Because you can't be using those fucking uh, those water balloon torpedoes. <laughs> <laughs> also, make sure you get a real nice speech out to your crew about how um, there's a good chance they're going to die and they'll die like yours. I don't know if you oh, I guess Wrath of Khan hasn't happened yet. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, let, let let these recruits know you might be getting sucked out into space today. So we do uh, have our next bit of the Section 31 plot here when 
uh, Reed gets taken back to his quarters and Archer has snooped around and found an image of Harris, his handler. And they start having a conversation like, who the fuck is this guy? Because there's no record of him after five years ago. He's just it just stops. And Reed still doesn't really want to tell him what's going on. Um, I want to have like a deeper Section 31 conversation now, if that's OK. Yeah. I just <clears throat> the other thing I want to say about this episode real quick. The number of plots in this thing is crazy. Yeah, I'm going like to start five. writing them down. So, <laughs> yeah. so just just so we're staying current here, there is um the speed, speed plot. Mm-hmm. There's to Paul and trip. Yep. There's uh naughty read. Naughty read. There's the actual like uh flocks trying to cure the disease. There's and then flocks. There's, there's the Klingons trying to make augments, which is like separate but happening at the same time. Where would we put uh nice doctors redemption arc? It's really tied into both of those though. I don't think Fair. that's separate. It's part of the it's five plots. Five's enough. <laughs> I, I I bet you there's more and it'll come up as we as we continue on this. All right, so section 31. Canonically, this is the first time that we are being exposed to it. Right? All right. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just clicking around. Short of um, there being some sort of a time travel or a flashback episode in something else. So, in terms of the viewers continuity, this is obviously well worn territory thanks to DS9, but in the continuity of the timeline of Star Trek, this would be the first time it's coming up. Yes. You know, Reed talks about like he was recruited. It's, you know, clandestine service. That's why it's like very under wraps. Archer seems to understand that by implication. But I mean, clandestine warfare or just having a clandestine service, that's not exactly a revolutionary concept, right? Like that's that's just something every government has had for a century in in our real existence, right? So the idea that the Federation has a CIA is not crazy, right? I know it's supposed to be an idealistic, you know, future, but the idea that there are some realists who understand that maintaining an idealistic future requires doing terrible things on occasion that are not idealistic because idealism is peaceful and history is violent, uh, is makes sense. It totally makes sense. This is just kind of stupid, right? Like there, th- section 31 has no reason to be working in this clandestine way on this topic. Like Flox easily could have been convinced to just go help the Klingons. No one had to lie about any of this. And, th- it's, and, and that's the problem with it. It's a Rube Goldberg plot. Yeah. Section 31 is introduced in DS9. That's the first time there's ever anything Correct. to do with it. Um, I don't like section 31. It, you know, it's one, you bring something out, it's there. Maybe you can do a good job, um, weaving it into the existing tapestry. Maybe not. Uh, once it's there, you can retroactively add it and, and make as much or as little of it as you want in along the timeline. Right. But the genie's out of the bottle for me. Uh, you know, one way to look at Star Trek as a whole is two buckets. And one is uh, the stuff Roddenberry wanted there. And then the other is stuff Roddenberry didn't put in there. And maybe there's another little cup in there. Would he have wanted it? You know, there's two Star Treks. I don't think there's he would this... want it at all. No, I mean, absolutely not. Definitely not. His view of Star Trek was an optimistic uh fantasy view of a humanity that had ascended and you know that he wasn't really there trying to tell gritty stories about uh you know military drama or whatever it was good guys out doing good in the galaxy and overcoming space dilemmas not uh strapping people to seats and and electrocuting their nipples with a car battery to get the answers that they wanted i, I mean i guess we did just review though for Patreon exactly the reason why I think there's 
purchase to the idea that something like Section 31 fits within Star Trek, and that is Wrath of Khan. You know, when when Star Trek took the turn into being serious naval drama in space Mm -hmm. and becoming more militaristic and more grounded in reality, even if it still continued to be about uh, trying to keep your ideals ascendant over, you know, base instincts. The the concept that there's a, a Federation CIA really does make a lot of sense. I get it. It would exist. Frankly, so, it would exist. Here's how I would have done it. And, you know, it's already out there. And as a writer in Star Trek, after all the stuff that uh, DS9 did, like you can't retcon it. You, you have to you can only roll what's with it and hope that as you build more and more to the story, it works. The bad example is the Borg where you had something really good in one show and then another show just fucking ran it into the ground um, to varying degrees. But the way that I I think if they would have sat down and just said, hey, we're going to discuss everything that Star Trek could be. We're going to build a timeline. (laughs) We're not going to say the eugenics wars were in the 90s. All the shit that's wrong with Star Trek. You had a chance to like, let's make a Bible and we're going to stick to it. I think Section 31 is accomplishing something that needs to happen in a real organization. But I think that it cannot exist as an organization within that larger organization like the Federation. Right. I mean, that's why its existence is considered uh, a state secret and it doesn't like even people like Archer aren't brought in to what they're doing. They exist outside the structure of Starfleet because they understand that the for the Federation cannot cotton to its existence. Right. And that's again, like they're retconning things, not retconning, but they're, they're, they're ramrodding the stuff in here. And this is shit that, uh, what's his face didn't have to think about when he was writing DS nine. So you've got Archer's first experience with section 31 is a very ugly affair. A, he's got a subordinate who is betraying his trust and actively sabotaging a mission. He's got communication with the uh, the this Harris guy, who is uh, no help and mildly antagonistic, right? Well, that's not true. Like he ultimately does uh, give he gives the bag up to Archer enough that uh, Reed is able to fill in the last piece of the puzzle for him, and they were able to go to where they need to go. Um, you know, you've he, got, and he knew that too because he ends up telling the Klingons, like, you know, Enterprise is fucking coming, and not that he would know, but that conversation to me felt like him giving the Klingons the okay to blow up enterprise. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, you've got Reed who does become aware that this whole fucking thing got away from them. And for whatever section 31 thinks of itself, ultimately it fails. It's tap not fails. It's plan fails. The task is accomplished, but it's not because of the way that section 31 wanted to do it. And I think they acknowledge the read acknowledges like this exactly what you're saying. None of the shit had to happen. We could have done this uh, a smart way and not endangered everybody, which Reed could have brought up to Archer and said, yeah, you know, this is a real fucking problem here. So Archer, who is going to go on to become the president of the United Federation of Planets, who knows about this rotten organization in Starfleet, uh, the fact that someone who's going to have a tremendous amount of power as all these other organizations, these other uh, na- worlds come in that he would tolerate this thing's existence is ridiculous and also you've got the vulcans who have been up earth's ass you're going to tell me that these guys who pre surak's teachings were surfacing right the 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 high command era vulcan which is a bunch of shitty bad people who are okay with genocide and stuff that they would tolerate earth having this uh this vicious organization is ridiculous that as the two unify into the United Federation of Planets, like they could be like, listen, you know, when it was just earth doing stuff. Yeah, sure. You have your CIA. Now that we're all uniting under the same flag, this fucking thing's got to go. Oh, that's, that is why, like when you hear about section 31 and DS nine, it is thought of as something that is not part of the Federation, right? They don't, I think that actually dovetails nicely into how they try to position this idea, which is you're absolutely right. Like no one would tolerate the Federation having a CIA like this, which is why they don't answer to the Federation. They, they, they serve it in darkness. You know, that's the idea is 
you know, we, we know what we're doing is unacceptable to everyone, but it's things that must be done and we will just do them even though you object to it. Like that's the attitude they end up taking. Yeah. But and that's how never... you see them in DS nine, which do they ever ultimately get brought has a lot to... of ramifications. What do they ultimately get brought to justice at any point? Do yes. any of those guys get dragged out into the light and, and prosecute? sure do. All right. Well then that's cool. And, and I can <laughs> accept that. But anyways, if I was going to go back and redo this, uh, I would make section 31, a, secret society within Starfleet. And you kind of saw that from time to time in next gen where captain, some sort of a conspiracy where captains and some admirals uh, would meet in darkness. There wasn't an official structure. Uh, there was no, it's like a Hydra, right? There's no way to right. cut the head off of it. And if you get busted working with this naughty group, that's your ass. But in the end, it's just captains and admirals and commanders having to be real at certain moments and do things they're not proud of uh, and not this fantasy organization that has goofy leather outfits and has Rube Goldberg plans when you could just be like Flox, who you go cure this disease for us. And you'd be like, yes, I will. Why don't we just go there right now? Like mm -hmm. anyway, so we, we have cut back to the actual plot, which is this which, which virus. Plot? I got six, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. I got five plots. What the arc is supposed to be about, which is, you know, the Klingons fucking around with augment DNA and accidentally infecting themselves with the plague. And it appears that Flox has been tortured by uh, Space Uncle Phil. General Uncle Phil, yeah. General Uncle Phil. He's playing to win. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not enjoying being tortured. He doesn't want to participate in creating, you know, Klingon genetic supermen. Uh, but he is visited in his uh, cell by his physician uh, friend, Dr. Antak, who is going to successfully convince him on the basis that first, you know, we need you because I'm not smart enough to solve this problem. And second, here's the proof. You actually found a way to deal with this. And what we can do is cut the disease off in stage one as a way to cure it. And in stage one, it just creates, you know, some some surface level physical changes like a lack of cranial ridges, but otherwise they're not actually augments. They're not they're not uh supermen in any way. They're just, you know, weird Puerto Ricans dressed in gold lame. And you know, Flox is and just like agrees to help, but notes like if you tell General Uncle Phil that we're doing this, he's gonna kill us. And uh Antok's like, oh yeah, that, that we, our lives, the exchange of millions, what an honorable way for healers to die. Let's go. You just, you just, that's not a threat. I'm a Klingon. Let's like, you're telling I me I'm going to take an honorable death. Yeah, let's go. I love that the concept of honor is prevalent through all of the castes in Klingon culture. And yeah. all that we've really been exposed to is the warrior interpretation of an honor, honorable death. And this guy, he's not like, frothing oh yes this is a glorious way to like oh no yeah that you know the math checks out uh th this is this is gonna be a good way to die yeah okay all yeah, the more is, reason let's push I, it yeah 85 percent chance likelihood i'll wind up in stovacore i like that <laughs> so the current batch of augment infected klingons who successfully raided enterprise are they juiced? Are the are they superior strength, or are they just physically deformed? They they're juiced. So the implication is the that commando team is juiced. Everyone that's infected right now is technically juiced, and then that stabilizing it in stage one is going to cause them to lose those abilities. Oh, really? So yes, they're not going to be like a limited crop of super soldiers. They ended up getting. They're they're going to retroactively. Uh, lose all of that stuff and then just be more human looking. Correct. Um, Cause ultimately that's, you know, solving for the episode's real reason for existing, right? Klingon Klingons looking different in TOS. And again, all they, they didn't even need to, it, you know, you had a homework assignment that was just, Hey, fill out this ditto sheet. It's six problems, whatever. And someone coming in like, Actually, I've written the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I made a one-to-one uh, -one scale Mount Vesuvius. Like, you did not need to tell this plot, the story, to answer 
60s bad sci-fi makeup. The complexity of it, the amount of callback, the Soong stuff, this guy's relationship with his son. Um, on talk himself talking about how he was like disowned by his family because he's from a family of warriors and he chose to be a healer. Um, you know, like, yeah, there's so much, as you said at the beginning, interesting cost, texture that, that allows themselves to, that, that they allow themselves to explore here. The uh, cautionary tale again about genetic engineering hot on the heels of us watching Khan. And uh, what's the line that they throw in there? Uh, you know, their increased aggression is marked is uh, matched only by the decreased inhibition when uh, Flox is going at it with General Uncle Phil. You know, you make these guys, you're not going to be able to control them. Earth did it and it killed millions. Well, Klingons have more discipline. Uh, not enough. Right. Yeah. And we keep beating this dead horse or whatever, but just the disservice that Strange New Worlds does to the body of work that is why the Federation doesn't fuck with genetic engineering that is all done so well. Like you've got just, yeah, nobody I got, I'm, can... I'm glad this experience can educate you as to why so many people just decided Strange New Worlds was dead to them after that. Like all of this fantastic work done to explain why genetic engineering is a terrible fucking idea, especially in the Federation, only to have it just. Uh, ruined by very bad writers that took a way too soft approach. You like, I hate, okay, I don't know how to put it. A feminine approach to the concept. A a all we all all you lack is understanding. Like, no, no, actually, it's just a bad idea, and you don't want to do it. All you lack is understanding. There's how many episodes now that have been dedicated to the dangers of genetic engineering in the Star Trek universe, like. If you wanted to pick some thing and be like, well, what was kind of a what's something that we can use as an allegory for Federation racism, right? Like if you wanted to go back to that terrible season one episode of TNG where they go to like planet Africa. Yeah. And like it's just the most cringe fucking episode possible that everybody has rightfully shunned. And you want to stunt on that episode. Fine. That's a great episode to do some sort of virtue signal plot on. But to go to this genetic engineer thing where there's just rock solid story over dozens of episodes and multiple series and movies and whatever, like that was the wrong hill to fucking start a, a fight on. And, um, and you mentioned Flox's uh, conversation with General Uncle Phil where he's trying to explain like you are going down a fucking terrible plan. The humans had thousands of these guys running around. They lost control of them immediately. Do you think you're going to you think you're going to have be more successful because you're disciplined? No, that won't. It won't happen the way you think it's going to happen. Here's the interesting thing about General Uncle Phil is that I he has no real redemption in this. And no. I really thought that him having a son who was infected and who he thought he lost as a consequence of his secret program. Right. Right. But there was going to be some moment of reckoning uh, when his uh, his augmented super soldiers come in and just, uh, hey, yeah, we went in there and kicked their ass. And he's like, I'm a general and you will respect my rank and greet me with sir. Like <coughs> already seeing that he's losing control of these guys that there would be yeah. some just that moment of reckoning. I, I thought either he was going to fully go back and say, no, this is wrong. And I want my son, you know, I care about my son after all. And I've learned my lesson. Or he was going to end up getting fucking shanked in the gut by that super soldier lady who's just like, you know, you're weak, you're the past, blah, blah, blah. And like, oh, only in the end do I sit here laying, dying, reeling that, uh, you know, we can't play God. The, the scenes were there. They were out of order. You know, he needed to boast of the confidence of Klingon discipline as an answer to the augment question and then be visited with some kind of consequence after that. And then come around to saying, okay, I'm here to help solve this problem. You're right. You know, like that, all the scenes were there. They just didn't structure it quite right. But um, still, I mean, I don't think it hurts the episode that much that Space Uncle Phil kind of just it doesn't have an end to his arc, really. No, and I think also I'm sweet on the guy because it's Uncle Phil, right? If this right. was just any other actor who would have really given a shit, this guy's fun because it's, it's the shredder, right? <laughs> right. Oh, man, they needed him in a fight scene and he needed to kill an augment with blades mounted to his hand like the Shredder and Ninja Turtles. How <laughs> f 
Fuck this episode for not giving that to me. Fuck you, David Barrett. How dare you? Um, but it, not every ep- not every character needs to have. Yeah, you need just stupid fucking Klingon generals that help explain, like, this is why the Klingon Empire never gets any better for the next hundreds of years. So to move it along, um, Archer, while hanging out with Porthos, who remains the most adorable beagle of all time, Mm. Harris contacts him and is like, hey, what's up? I understand you've been looking for me. Let's have a conversation. Archer thinks Porthos is sad because Phlox hasn't been there to visit him. Porthos is sad. Because, uh, what was that Suleban's name? Hello, John. Anyways, he hasn't been able to sneak on the ship and, and really give Porthos the good diarrhea cheese. That's what he's bummed about. His 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 imaginary friend's not there anymore. Crawling around on the ceiling, dropping treats in his bowl. Silic. Silic, that's right. Yeah. Rip. Um, so Harris contacts him. Um, Archer's not having any of his shit, but eventually does get enough good information out of him that when he goes to talk to Reed, Reed kind of gives up the last piece of the puzzle, which is the location that Flox is likely at Kuvat colony, which we know is correct. And so finally we have all the pieces of the puzzle coming together. We've got enterprise and Columbia who are going there. We have a Klingon fleet that's coming to destroy the planets. And we've got Flox racing against time to try and cure the disease. And we're, we know that the Klingon that enterprise has captured is uh, space. Uncle Phil's son. And the way this all comes together is a little sloppy, uh, but ultimately works because of Flox. So Flox says, I've got four samples. One of these samples is going to cure the disease. The other three is going to infect the people who get them. I have no way of doing this quickly except to infect healthy Klingons with one of each. And one of you is going to be immune and the other three are going to get infected. He doesn't even propose that. Right. That is such an unthinkable thing that that's not even an option he puts on the table. He says, oh, he- I just I need a week to be able to test these the right way. And they're like. What if we do something unconscionable? Well, he says that that is the other solution. He doesn't suggest moving forward with it. He is ultimately not given the choice, of course, and infects the two bodyguards, General Uncle Phil and on And wouldn't you know it? It's General Uncle Phil, who's the one that ends up with the cure. And they are able to start working expeditiously towards an answer. However, before they're able to complete this work, uh, the Klingons uh, and Enterprise and Columbia all show up and the Klingons start trying to liquidate the colony. It's got some kind of shields, not going to last very long. Archer beamed down by his fuck self for some reason into this Klingon colony to go spring flocks. Zero He knows these Makos aren't. Uh, up to snuff anymore and they're just a liability <laughs> like, i gotta power level my makos before i bring them on any missions i bring too many people they're gonna shoot us i show up by myself i think they're just gonna punch me and it's been a while since daddy got his <laughs> rocks off so you guys stay up here i'm gonna go hit some shore leave and we'll meet up next week and while they're there um we've got enterprise and columbia attempting to can, you know, shoot at the Klingons to try and get them to stop bombarding the colony. Meanwhile, Phlox has come up with a plan. Part one of the plan is that I need to find a cure. The only way I can find a cure is if I put this into a human host because it's based on a human augment DNA virus to accelerate the creation of the antibodies required to cure the disease. Okay, good enough. As medical... uh. Uh, jargon talk goes i follow the logic the second is hey on talk put a bunch of the disease into a little container and put it on that transporter pad for me i've got i've got an idea to convince these guys to stop bombing us so they, they strap archer down they infect him he gets little ridges he's freaking out it's a nice moment that shows that archer's willing to be very self-sacrificial to save everyone's lives in terms of like at convincing the klingons on the surface at least to allow this to happen they get the the antibodies out, and then, as as mentioned, they don't explain how they're able to do this. There's plenty of possible explanations. Could be like a prefix code thing. Could be they had to lower shields due to the orbital bombardment, whatever. They don't mention it. They just beam the disease onto the ship of the admiral who's leading the the liquidation of the planet, 
and goes, hey, you're infected by the disease now. Don't blow us up or I won't cure you. <laughs> Very confusing, that sequence of events, because, I, you know, I'm taking notes and I'm paying attention, but little stuff gets by sometimes. So when Phlox is like, oh, I got this aerosol thing. I figured that was the cure and they were going to beam it up high in the atmosphere and like disperse it over the colony and be like, hey, we're fine. And when they beam it over to the ship and you're like, oh, it's just a fucking can of poison gas. <laughs> I'm sitting there and it's like, OK, well, that's a solid play is, you know, you infect the guy. So now he's motivated for the cure. Um, I think my headcanon, though, is that the Klingons and the rest of the galactic community that have shields, their worry was people beaming their stuff off and stealing and that the shields were just like outward facing and that never at any point had ever occurred to someone to like beam something onto a ship. Like that's human ingenuity right there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Slip, slip. It's, it's like slipping the knife through the plates, you know, the fucking uh, general reports back and he's like, uh, yeah, listen, we got to spare this kind of, that, that's not the real reason we got a big fucking problem guys. Did you know that, the shields don't block people from putting stuff that this could have been a fucking pipe bomb. It's lucky. It was just a disease that he had already found the cure to. Luckily, it's like nice people who did this and it wasn't a, we gotta, we gotta go back to the drawing board on this shield stuff, guys. Um, so at this point, Archer has now, uh, become a great captain and reached pinnacle human. Mm -hmm. Uh, he has had the, Vulcan Jesus in his head, and he has absorbed that culture. So good. He can tell people how to mind meld. Uh, he has made himself a Klingon for 15 minutes. Yes. Actually, much longer because the, the, there's going to be lingering effects here. Y you know, I can sit here and joke about how basically, you know, that that's his new fetish is like becoming other people or like <laughs> other species. Yeah. But I like the idea that the first president of the United Federation of Planets is going to be this guy who has a superhuman. He is the only guy for the job. This this is a guy who has been a Vulcan, who has been a Klingon, who is able to have all these deep space adventures and go into this job with a perspective that no other person in the Federation uh, could possibly have, and that he's really become, yeah, uh, something truly unique and special, and and that's what the United Federation of Planets needs, especially in those formative years, is someone with unlimited perspective. I completely agree. It's painting his lore very vividly in a way that makes it make a lot of sense that he is the man of history he ultimately becomes. And then that's probably the most generous way to read his story is that we watched him become a great captain. So he obviously wasn't one to start and he has become one now. He was think, miserable to start. And I think so miserable that it it suggests that he wasn't right for the job to begin with. So it's a bit it's a bit jarring sometimes to see that how much better he is. Yeah, they went uh, too far the wrong way. Yeah, like you needed he needed to be OK and then become great, <laughs> not be dog shit and then become great. I don't think they intended that, though. I think that was just product of bad writing. But the Klingons turn very reasonable after this uh, and say, OK, fine, I guess we <laughs> won't destroy this colony. <laughs> also, in this uh, Archer beaming down or Archer getting it, but whatever the hell happened, I need a general Uncle Phil to turn and see you have to be like, oh, this motherfucker, <laughs> this fugitive ass motherfucker. Do you know how I want and you bring him here? They're going to kill the whole fucking colony just to zap this guy. Forget about the fucking disease. Why would you bring this guy down here? He is so persona non grata. So despite the fact they invaded Klingon space and shot at Klingon ships and then infected a Klingon crew with the disease. Flag everyone, officer. Everyone gets to just leave <laughs> without comment. <laughs> None, I don't understand that, but they ran out of time. So. I also like that the admirals. Uh, armada, the, the whatever the, the task force he's bringing out to nuke shit from space because it's the only way to be sure. I'm guessing these aren't like Buster, um, you know, cargo craft, these are probably like badass ships. And that Enterprise is moving in the fucking field of fire and taking shots. And it's like Enterprise not instantly fucking greased, nor is Columbia. Like they both got 
such thick plot armor this episode. It is ridiculous. We do get one last uh, check in with Antok before the end of the episode. He is now uh, has no uh, forehead ridges like everybody else that is going to recover from this disease. He relayed during the episode that all of this was his fault. Um, he didn't screen his subjects well enough, and that's why they were infected with that disease, and he turned it into, you know, super COVID. So, um, you know, he's contemplating what he's going to do next. Maybe he'll get into forehead rich reconstruction, should be a booming market. But mostly he's just says, and em- em- empathetically to Flox, thank you. Like, you saved the day. You made up for my mistake. You put an end to something that I didn't want to be doing to begin with, and, you know. He he's mournful and Phlox, you know, acknowledges that, but he's obviously still disquieted by what he's been uh, forced to do. And, you know, we we get a little bit of time with um, Archer recovering and, you know, telling Hernandez, thanks for coming and helping us invade Klingon space, but you should probably like go do something that's like normal Explorer stuff and not the nonsense batshit insane crap I do. Uh, but Hey, I'll leave Tucker here with you so you can help your fix your engines for a while. And we'll, we'll hook up back later. Yeah. We're definitely giving you back to him. Wink, wink. Right. And she's like, sure, John wink, wink. <laughs> and uh, lastly, of course we get Reed telling, uh, Harris, I ain't working for you no more. This was bullshit. This was dumb. I only report to John Archer. Peace. Klingon hottie Lanneth. She is the lead augmented Klingon that is a uh, flex and nuts on general uncle Phil. Yeah. Kind of dunks him saying, you know, your son was a punk. Did he die? An honorable death? Uh, no humans got him. Fuck you. <laughs> um, there's a concern about how they're going to be outcasts, how they're going to be treated, even if they survive this thing. And General Uncle Phil's like, as long as I'm alive, um, you know, we'll make sure that there's that, that the High Council will respect you. Uh, inside, it's still a Klingon heart beating, and that's all that matters. And she lays this dialogue out, you know, is it really? Because when we were over there running hot dick on Enterprise, I felt fear for the first time since I was 12. And I saw it in everybody else's eyes, too, like, I like that, again, this uh, this augment process, it's it's so dangerous. It's stripping away what it means at its core to be a Klingon, which is, you know, just a fearless battle uh, thing. Again, more cautionary tale that General Uncle Phil doesn't really pick up on. But I'm curious when she loses her augment powers, if uh, that that humanity is going to strip away too or if that stays because if these go on to be the Klingons that you see like clearly there's got to be more story to these guys that was also the the story I was waiting to see here is like do the augments say fuck it we're we're not okay with getting nuked from space we're gonna go up and fight the general we're gonna go start a civil war or something um are these people who have had their ridges stripped are they going to be human emotional moving forward I think the implication was no but I don't, they don't revisit it, so it's hard to know for, sh- for sure, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. But interesting thought. I, it was a, like a plot point that I, they could have actually developed further in the episode. But they, they leave it there, basically. They leave it on that bit of dialogue. How could you develop further? Again, speed to Paul and Trip, Naughty Reed, Phlox, Klingon Augments, Section 31, there is so much shit packed in here and some of the plots are better than others. But I mean, this was a full episode of stuff. It was all done pretty well bordering great. Um, to me, the the big gem of this story was Klingons were fucking around trying to make augments and they had to learn their lesson, too. Yeah, that's and I really also liked the. Just the overall concept of. Um, on talk as a Klingon healer like that, that continuing sort of look into the Klingons before they became who we knew them to be when they still had some pieces of a functional society left. Um, just like with Saul Gachman uh, mm. and shout out. Oh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to get discord up. I'm gonna Jonesy. Find guys. Jonesy. Jonesy. Yeah. Shout out to Jonesy, by the way, for being the Saul Gachman originator. Glad you he uh, also brought us a trailer deck. He did. The, so, the the holodeck of now 
<laughs> a trailer deck. Although, you know, you can have a true trailer deck, which only costs between $200 and $500 if you go with the the Meta Quest series, or you could be a uh, a real fancy redneck and get yourself the what, four thousand dollar Apple 4, Vision Pro. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> no thanks. You know what? But I you can know have what? A I... car, a used car, strapped to your face. <laughs> you know what I want though? I want to watch the next episode of Enterprise. What is it? Man, this is crazy. I'm looking at the list. There's six episodes left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is a shame because it feels like this series has just finally started. It's finally gotten footing where I care about not only the story that they're telling, you know, these characters are getting uh, complex and interesting to the point mm-hmm. where I, I care if they live or die. Right. Yeah. They've grown, and it took them a long fucking time. I was on board with the Voyager guys early into season one. These fucking people especially like Reed, like, okay, Reed is becoming a compelling character now. How, who would have thought? Uh, and we only got six more of these. Oh, hell, look at that. I got this up. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> look, got look what the cat dragged in. <laughs> three Orion slave girls twerking. Written by Manny Cotto. Thank you, Manny. All right, we're getting into Bound, season four, episode 17. Uh, while Paul and Tucker discover that they have developed a psychic bond Little little slow on the uptake there, guys. Captain Archer receives three Orion slave girls as a gift for negotiating with the devious Orion syndicate with rather disastrous results. Everybody loves showering Archer with slave girls and prostitutes. Did he learn nothing from Rajine? This We're going to find a... out that, in fact, he learned nothing from Rajine. <laughs> this is going to be uh, Manny Cotto and, oh, wait, Alan Croker. Yep. Gosh, when's the last time we saw him around? This is the last w- one shot episode of Enterprise and thus the last, you know, independent one shot episode of S- Berman Era Trek. This is it. And um, it goes out in booby glory, my friend. Yeah, with a bang. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Peace. Peace.